Okay, it looks like we have a pretty good crowd here. Uh, um, let's get started. I don't want to uh, delay this too much. I'm Chris Myers, and I'm here with Citrus. I manage the Invention Lab downstairs on the first floor. And uh, I, would have, I want to welcome everyone to the Citrus Research Exchange. And this is actually the 10th, 10 year anniversary of the Research Exchange, so pretty special event. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovator, innovators on this stage. Um, and we're glad that you're here today. So today's talk is co-presented uh, with our, sorry, with our Citrus Aviation Program, which focuses on UAV testing and applications that address large-scale societal changes. The program builds upon a network of labs, facilities, and experts across the Citrus, the four Citrus campuses. Our speaker today is Greg, uh, is Greg Krutzinger, founder of Scholar Farms. He will share his very timely work on drones and geospatial data in the aftermath of California's wildfires. We ask that you please do not interrupt the talk to ask questions. There will be dedicated times at the end for Q&A. Before I introduce our speakers, uh, a few announcements. February 11th to 15th is uh, Love Data Week at Berkeley, co-sponsored by Citrus. Love Data Week is a nationwide, nationwide program designed to raise, raise a, awareness about data management, security, sharing, and preservation. Flyers are located on the table. Uh, February 13th, the next week, is um, Citrus Research Exchange featuring Assistant Professor Erin Hester from UC Merced, discussing her work in remote sensing, water, security, and biodiversity. March 8th, Citrus is hosting a symposium on women in technology and the future of AI, including announcements of this year's winners of the annual of Witty UC Athena Awards, recognizing leaders who embody, encourage, and promote the inclusion of women in technology. A few seats are left, so please sign up on invite, Inventbrite. Uh, flyers are also on the table. Okay, um, Dr. Greg Krutzinger is founder of Scholar Farms, which specializes in training for vegetation mapping using multispectral cameras and drones. More recently, the company expanded into rapid disaster mapping to assist in California wildfires. While conducting his PhD research as a Miller postdoctoral fellow in ecology and evolutionary biology here at UC Berkeley, Dr. Kretzinger caught the drone bug and began testing the use of UAVs for field projects. Following a faculty appointment at the University of British Columbia, he moved into industry as sales director for scientific and academic verticals at PIX4D and Parrot and the academic programs director at 3D Robotics. He was recognized by Vice.com as a person of the year in 2017 for being, quote, the drone engineering helping farms work smarter. And without further ado, All Dr. Right. Kretzinger. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I think my mic's on. Um, I'm gonna kind of kept this talk to be fairly broad uh, about drone technology and specifically for applications um, for the campfire, kind of the most applications uh, that we talk about. But I'll talk specifically about drones and data and kind of where we're at as an industry, uh, and then we'll move into uh, some of the applications. But I wanted to talk a little bit about just kind of my wandering career path. Um, so I did start as an academic. Um, so this was me as an assistant professor. Um, I had my own lab and graduate students. Uh, and I got excited about drones for plant research. Uh, so drones are flying robots. They can do things again and again very repeatedly. So I thought that might be better than undergrad field assistants. Um, and so I started playing around with them. This is about 2014, 2015 when drones kind of flew OK and we were zip tying GoPros and things like that. I got very much excited about the technology. And um, at that time, the rules and regulations for drone technology um, were fairly stringent for academic use. Um, so really the innovation was happening in the tech space and I wanted to be kind of front and center in that innovation. And so I did a very foolish thing, which was to leave a, a paycheck and a pension and tenure track position uh, and join the tech industry. And so um, basically I joined the drone space. This is me uh, full of drones and going to drone, kind of entering the drones and aviation uh, world. Um, this uh, kind of downward slant is my slow kind of very painful fall down the stairs of the ivory tower of academia and kind of the realization of the private sector. Um, and, and during this time I've gone through uh, a couple of different startups and um, that have lost hundreds of millions of dollars competing in the drone space. Um, but I have really nice hoodie sweatshirts from those startups. 
Uh, from there, I started, uh, I founded a company that really leverages my academic background. So, and that's really for agriculture and vegetation mapping. So for the most part, my clients uh, that I work with are companies that want to scale their drone programs and drone data for agriculture. Um, that's typically what I think about since I'm a plant scientist. Um, and I have an online master class that I train lots of graduate students and other researchers uh, how to use drone technology, specifically on the data side. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of what I do as a company, you can go to scholarfarms.com, but I won't talk uh, about that very much. So then uh, this foray into disaster mapping has been something unique that has happened over the past uh, about year and a half or so. And it really started from just kind of relationships within the drone industry. I'll skip forward. Uh, for the most part, when I worked on the software side of drones for one of the major companies that processes drones into maps, I met Alameda County Sheriff's Department. So they're local here, right? So they're um, basically, they're one of the most active drone teams in the country for public safety and, uh, and applications and search and rescue, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, I happen to just know them from the industry, um, and sometimes with law enforcement and public safety teams, um, they just call people that they know and that um, aren't total jerks and happen to be slightly technical. And so that's kind of how I fell into it. It's a very low bar, um, but since then we've done a whole lot of different things. So it really started with uh, the ghost ship fire um, that happened just a couple of years ago, right? So in Oakland, the big warehouse fire that happened um, with a lot of fatalities. During that, there was a very high pressure event with lots of agencies involved, and I pr provided a very small amount of text technical advice of how to map the structure very quickly um, before they started going in and kind of removing things. So it was, it was a very sad uh, and very high stress situation that I just basically advised on. From that, when the uh, Tubbs fire hit Santa Rosa in October of 2017, then I was called in to help, again, very quick mapping using drone technology uh, starting with some fatality sites and then moving into mapping uh, most of Coffee Park, which was one of the heavily devastated areas, uh, as well as other kind of rural areas within the county. From there, I got called again um, by these teams um, to do redding. Uh, and so when the about a thousand homes or so burned up during the car fire, um, and then more recently Paradise this past uh, November, and that was, you know, 14,000 homes or so. Um, so I, these are very sad and tragic situations. I tend to um, try and keep a sense of humor about it, but if I do joke at all, it's mostly like because it's super sad and tragic, and if you don't like somehow keep a casual nature of it, it's like really sad. Um, so I do take it very seriously, but my personality is very casual uh, in how I talk about those things. So just keep that in mind. Um, so they keep calling me, and I keep going to these situations, um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we go in and operate and map these, uh, these very kind of tragic situations, high pressure, and how we do it very quickly. Um, so this is the group. It started with Alameda County. Um, it spread to other agencies, and then it recently it was a whole lot of different drone teams. Um, you can usually see me, I wear like, I kind of stand out within the crowd. I'm usually wearing some sort of flannel. It's like my brand uh, when I go in. I have a very specific disaster flannel actually that I wear. It's not that one, it's a yellow one that you'll see uh, later on. But it's basically, these are all the pilots and the teams and then I'm just a data analyst. So I don't even fly the drones. It's mostly kind of coordinating and orchestrating the flow of information during these disasters and, and following these disasters. This is also at a time, just to keep in mind, that drones are a very sensitive thing within wildfires, and specifically this is because of a lot of um, public safety uh, uh, situations that arise uh, with consumers flying drones during wildfires and grounding manned aircraft and manned air attack. So you, this is Berkeley, so you might think drones are slightly annoying. My wife also thinks that drones are slightly annoying, but this is super annoying of, of consumers and very dangerous of consumers kind of entering these situations. So everything I'm gonna talk about today is all public safety teams going in with drones that are, that are all kind of certified within working within the system. But I wanna take a step back and talk briefly about kind of why drones are a thing uh, right now and why you kind of see them everywhere for better or for worse, particularly if you're down at Cesar Chavez Park um, walking your dog, there's drones all over the place. I am not gonna talk about military drones. I know nothing about those. 
um, except that they're military drones and I see them on the news. I'm talking more about the consumer side and I'll really just run through a brief history of the consumer side of drones, which really starts in 2017 with the launch of the iPhone, right? Steve Jobs came out not too far away from here, black turtleneck, launched the iPhone, we all have one now. But with that launch in 2007, became very low cost technology for geospatial positioning. So the GPS in our phones, the accelerator, uh, accelerometers and IMUs, so right, so balancing and, uh, and things we use to play Candy Crush, for example, uh, as well as lots of other tiny miniaturization of the hardware now for pennies on the dollar compared to hundreds of thousands of dollars before. All of those components then became the low cost autopilots that are the brains of drones, right? It's basically a Raspberry Pi equivalent uh, or of iPhone and smartphone technology that we put in the brain of a drone and we add some motors and the thing flies and we can program it and we can basically have a flying robot. All of that stems from kind of the launch of, the sm of smartphone technology. From 28, 29, 2010, we saw the rise of the do-it-yourself, build the drone uh, movement. And this was a large con contingent of kind of DIY community, of hackers, of makerspace, building flying contraptions that flew just kind of okay. It's mostly kind of dudes in their garage. The drone industry in general is mostly dudes. Um, and, and that's just the fact, it's like 98% male. Uh, and these were contraptions that kind of got people excited about like, hey, we're moving from kind of the remote control space uh, to kind of the Raspberry Pi programming space and then eventually to kind of connected device space. And that was all kind of uh, 2008, 2009, et cetera, people wanting to build their own drones. Turns out most consumers don't wanna build their own drones. They just wanna buy something off the shelf. So in 2013, DJI, which will eventually become the leader in the market, launched the Phantom series. I call these the white ones um, because they're about 78% of the market now are the white ones. And this was a very quick iteration uh, from 2013 onwards of drones that flew pretty well with GoPros to incredibly well with fully integrated, very high resolution cameras. DJI now owns a majority share in Hasselblad, for example. 2015, drones arrived in the big box store. So it wasn't that long ago, about four years ago, the first drones entered Best Buy. And now it's like, you can go to Costco and like you get a giant thing of strawberries and a drone. Like that's just like a normal thing, right? Um, and lots of toilet paper. Uh, 2016 then became a crash in the market. So we had that hype 2014, 2015, and then DJI basically uh, with manufacturing and innovative capabilities that based out of Shenzhen, basically collapsed the entire market. So we had 3D Robotics here locally. They lost about $120 million. Parrot, which I had moved to, um, they lost about $150 million or so. Um, other companies, Airware, who was in the city, they did more data side, they lost $100 million. Uh, there's been about a half a billion dollars worth of venture capital money lost uh, just trying to compete uh, uh, within the hardware space. GoPro, again, lost. 50, 60 million dollars, all trying to kind of compete with the innovation coming out of China. 2017 to present then is kind of where I'll stop with the history. And this is the launch of the consumer side. So, or the commercial side. So the consumer drone industry, that's a thing. DJI pretty much owns all of that. Some people are still trying to compete. Drone prices are now around $1,000 or so for a very capable, beautiful imagery coming off of a drone. Really, it's the rise of commercial applications of drones today. And that is the launch of the drone license. So before you had to have a manned aircraft license to fly a drone and make money with it. You had to actually go get a sports pilot license. And like, I'm a biologist and I don't want to, like, I'm not going to go and like get my sport pilot's license and learn about manned aviation to fly a toy. And so what they did was come out with for $200, you take a 60 question multiple choice test. As long as you get 45 of those 60 right, you are a commercial drone pilot. And that's good for two years. So the bar, pretty low now. You don't even have to know how to fly a drone. It's just kind of, you answer the multiple choice questions, pick the most conservative answer, typically for the FAA. Um, and, and we now have a rise of a commercial drone industri industry. So where we're at today, drones are super small and portable. They're about the size of a water bottle for some of the most portable ones, like a Mavic. Um, they're incredibly affordable um, for, as image capture platforms you know, 600 to $1,000. Actually, the most standard drone today for mapping in a commercial setting is a DJI Phantom 4 Pro. It's about $1,500, and that's used by professional surveyors. 
And also they're connected. So there's lots of different apps that kind of connect to the drone and you can pre-program the drone. Um, and so really drones are really all about the applications now and the data. And those data layers are really where the money's being made within the commercial industry. So we have two very high resolution 2D maps. So the drone flies and takes a lot of pictures. It flies in kind of a lawnmower pattern, takes a lot of pictures. We stitch those then into standard kind of 2D maps that are all corrected for uh, that bird's eye view. And then those can be uploaded in any standard kind of GIS software, for example. We can do surface models and terrain models and contour lines. These have lots of construction and infrastructure and mining applications. Uh, all your contour lines for building roads. We can do a lot of 3D models, and that's used for more in the CAD side of engineering, stockpile measurements, et cetera, how much stuff is in an area, and, and, or what's the structure of a building. We can do that all through photos with our drones now. I work on the agricultural side. We're looking at kind of heat maps of productivity and how to be, uh, use drones for more precision management. And then there's lots of tools coming out for automating the image classification deep learning, machine learning, et cetera. How do we take all of this data and how do we uh, then extract valuable information out of it? So kind of where we're at and the way to think about drones today, and then we're gonna talk about disasters, is kind of forget so much the drone, but it's drone to kind of connected devices within the phone and the different applications to the cloud and all the imagery and the data layers, et cetera. It's that workflow that's really important. And so where we're at right now is the verticalization of the commercial industry. So how do we take this drone to phone a cloud and how do we apply it to construction or mining or agriculture or surveying or public safety? Which brings us back uh, to where our topic is today of wildfire. So that's just kind of a brief history of how to understand both kind of why drones are a thing and then where the market is headed in terms of the application. So let's talk about um, California has a wildfire problem. So I think we all can agree on that. Um, I have a lot of kind of, a, I have a whole nother talk about kind of how I've experimented with different data layers up until the current wildfire and kind of developing them. Um, this is a 360 panorama of Coffee Park. So you can kind of see that whole kind of devastation side of it. Um, but as a scientist, I tend to kind of develop these different tools as I go along. Um, and honestly, a lot of it's kind of just shooting from the hip of just making things up as, as uh, these events happen. But that's kind of the state of the industry. There, there's no real common protocols today. So I'm going to talk about the campfire and what we did. Um, and this is bringing in a lot of the tools that were developed in some of the other fires as well. So November, what was it, November 7th or so, um, the start of the campfire. So here's a timeline uh, progression map uh, from CAL FIRE. And the blue areas are actually the first like 24 hours of the fire. So it started up in the up, upper corner up there uh, in, near the town of Polga. And it just basically came in and, and encapsulated all of paradise within that first day. So it was incredibly rapid. It basically jumped, you know, what would usually they'd plan for 12 hours took an hour. So it was just incredibly quickly. And then it spread throughout the farther part of the town. And then this is the 99 or so. Uh, coming up, and then Chico. So it was just a huge fire that, that, but most of the devastation that we saw was really in the first 24 hours uh, where it encapsulated the town. Here's a satellite view, and basically here's some uh, remote sensing data just cutting through the smoke. But you can see all of Paradise. Um, basically, the fire just went through the entire town and ravaged it within, the first, um, within that first really short period of time. Uh, when, and that's when you saw the media, everyone was evacuating very quickly, all the traffic jams, kind of all that huge problem. We were called in about a week later or so after manned aircraft kind of went, uh, that were fighting the fires, went into more rural areas of the county. That's typically when we're brought in and when CAL FIRE feels comfortable having drone teams come in. Still a lot of conservative uh, kind of thoughts about bringing drones into these disasters, and, and rightly so. Uh, we were brought in under the law enforcement side. Um, these, these kind of coordination of disasters is something I've learned a little bit about, and it's like, it's an amazing bureaucracy of coordination. Um, but we were brought in to, under the law enforcement side, and that was really at this time period where they were clearing homes um, and doing kind of search and recovery efforts. So at this time that we were called in, there were still kind of, they, they knew there, were, there was a couple of dozen fatalities at the time and still about a thousand people unaccounted for, which meant they were on a list somewhere um, and they were sorting through that list and then going home to home 
kind of clearing those things manually. We were brought in really to um, help with very high resolution imagery uh, to, to do risk assessments of is this possibly a fatality site? How do we get good eyes in the sky, et cetera? Typically, for this big of an area, you would actually bring in manned aircraft. It's better to bring in a helicopter. At this time, the smoke was really uh, uh, just kind of hanging around. I think if we remember in the Bay Area, it was just hanging around here as well. Um, and that prevented the visibility for manned aircraft to come in. So typically, a drone is like not the tool for the job. You would use uh, a manned aircraft, but that this was time was of the essence, and we couldn't actually do it because of visibility. So um, this is just a slide to remind me, there's a lot of prep work that goes into kind of pre-mission and pre-deployment. A lot of that is going and like stocking up in Best Buy for like lots of SD cards and hard drives and uploading your software, maintaining your software and charging batteries and all, all sorts of different prep work that I won't get into. Um, primarily what I as a data analyst is, am trying to do is get as much information as possible about the damage that we're going to go into and the scope of what the mission is going to be. And that involves conversations with different agencies, as well as this is the CAL FIRE structure damage assessment map of, uh, and each of the buildings is something that's destroyed. And so I'm tracking this. They release this every single day. Um, and so I was tracking this map and trying to use Google Earth to kind of figure out how many acres is this gonna be and how many flights would that be, which means how many batteries and how many teams Etc. This is all before we know that we're actually going to be requested uh, as a resource. I also tend to print hard copies of maps, and this is learned from other um, other events that uh, sheriffs like to work with hard copy maps, and so I tend to print those out. Um, I use the tabloid side; it's the cheapest size map if you're looking at Kinkos uh, that you can print. Uh, they're about two dollars a piece. Um, but here you can see this, the damage assessment, it's spreading out into the town. And so that was basically when we were called in, um, that was the most recent map that I had. And I printed all of those and we used that as kind of a base map to work off of and then checking our phones and looking for kind of other information coming in. Uh, so initially we were called in with about five teams or so. Um, and we, this was again under law enforcement and it basically our task was to map a certain section of the town of Paradise using drones uh, that they defined for us. And that was, uh, and those data then would go directly to the search and recovery teams. It looked a bit like this when we went in. Um, and this was way different than the previous fires where the smoke had kind of blown out by the time that we had went in. It just was hanging in that valley. Um, and so the first day was really just trying to figure out like, how are we going to do this? Um, and what is it going to look like? And how, how are we going to fly this? And what would the, how do we even stitch this and, and put this all together? Uh, we were also limited to about 200 feet that first uh, day coming in. So they're usually very conservative. Typical rules are 400 feet or below that you can map with drones. Um, but the 200 feet proved a problem because the trees are about 100, 100 feet tall and it's kind of rolling hills. And if you always have to maintain visual line of sight at 200 feet, when the drone moves like maybe 20 feet away or so over a tree, that angle, like you just can't see it. So it's like the drone take off and then it's totally gone. Um, it's right there, I can see it on my screen, but it's like, it's gone. So we were able to lift it to about 300 feet, which gave us kind of a broader field of view, made things very useful uh, in terms of actually just complying with the legal rules that they were given, um, as well as, um, uh, just being able functionally to see it. Thankfully, the winds kind of picked up and uh, blew a lot of the smoke away um, uh, about a day and a half later, which was much better for mapping. So the first kind of task was they wanted Paradise west of Clark. Clark was this kind of main drag and they wanted this full section. Um, and so we did what we did before, which is um, we took Sharpies on maps as well as our phones um, and just kind of draw, drew quadrants out for the teams and just assign people uh, quadrants and, and then they would go that, to those quadrants and they would map with the drones. We use standard off the shelf phantom drones. Uh, that way we can just kind of standardize the process and everyone's using the same apps on their phones. It's a very simple process. Um, this time around I tried this new stitching software that I use for agriculture that's like a really rapid stitching product. And so within 10 minutes or so I can get a map. Um, and that way I thought, oh, I can do you know, 2,000 acres, which is only five times the size we normally map. 
um, but I can have that delivered you know, by the end of the day. The problem with this software is A, it's really new and I was, it's kind of finicky, um, but there, because of that smoke and because we were trying to do things really quickly, there were a lot of gaps in the maps, those initial maps. And so it made me, I had to kind of recreate how we were gonna do this process and, and how quickly I could deliver the results with lots of people and agencies and badges kind of waiting for them. Um, and so that was kind of our first major problem was that like, what I thought was gonna work wasn't gonna work and mostly because of, of the smoke and how huge of an area. Problem two was that the recovery teams, um, the product I was giving them was way better than satellite data, but it's not nearly as good as traditional drone data, which is what they've gotten used to, and that's what they wanted. So they wanted higher resolution data, which looks more like this for the same data product. So this is a building we mapped down to about two inches per pixel or so, even down to about an inch per, per pixel. So very high resolution uh, data for the entire town. But what this means is that in this lawnmower pattern, it means I need all the photos to overlap more by 75, 80% than what I thought I could get away with, which was 50%. So it, it basically cuts any it given flight in half in terms of area that I could cover. It makes a much bigger task at hand. And some of this is kind of technical details. All I can say is like, it made it harder. Um, the other problem was that they updated the structure map. So like, I, there's a lot of miscommunication that happens during these disasters. And one of them is like, I can never figure out who actually makes these structure maps in order to talk to them directly. Cal Fire says it's the county, the county says it's Cal Fire, Cal OES doesn't know. Somebody out there makes these maps. Um, and the reason that's important is because this went to this. Um, and so it was basically, you know, here's a good section of town Here's the entire town. So it's just gone. And that was really kind of in the middle of why we're out there trying to figure out how to do this. Um, and so we got the call of like, no, we want it all. We want the whole thing. Um, and that's a way different thing than like just the west, paradise west of Clark. Um, so that was kind of one of those moments where you're like, all right, well, this is gonna be really hard. Um, the other thing that happened was that the president came into town. Um, so Trump came in and um, everything was grounded. And this actually ended up being a good thing, not for Jerry Brown, who doesn't look very happy there, but um, <laughs> it ended up actually letting us take a break um, and to think about like, basically like, how are we gonna get this done? Um, and so we had new mission parameters. So it just kind of, they changed the mission on us. Uh, so one is all of paradise at 300 feet altitude elevation. They wanted all the full resolution uh, data layers. I had 16 teams, uh, drone teams coming up from six different agencies. So not just Alameda County, Menlo Park Fire, Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office, um, Stockton Police. Um, I don't even, there's a whole list and there's, they were all coming. Um, and then we had two days to finish. So that was, at Thanksgiving was coming, the rains were also coming. And so they gave us two days, that's all they could commit for the mapping uh, and for all of these teams. Um, so that was like the mission should you choose to accept it. Um, but having Trump come in actually allowed us to really think about pre mission pre-planning. And so um, this is something we haven't dedicated a whole lot of time to, mostly because we're trying to do this under disaster situations. Um, but what we can do is actually we can pre-plan all the missions in the app. And that way when people show up, I just assign you a mission and I share it through our phones. Um, and so what that looks like is basically this. I highlight an area. The area I'm highlighting is based on that CAL FIRE structure map in, in Paradise. So we cut out forested areas and areas where there weren't buildings. We tried to keep each mission to about four or five batteries because that's typically what teams have before they need to recharge. And then I can create folders of different sections of towns and then I just share that with your phone. And that way it pops up and you have all your missions and you just go. And these, these folks really like to just go. They don't like to stand around for too long. So as much as possible, um, that's what we did. So we met in the Ace Hardware parking lot uh, up in, in Paradise and we segmented the entire town pre-planned pre and we just shared those and people logged in and then they just dispersed. And then as they finished their missions and their zones, they would be reassigned another zone and they would bring their SD cards back uh, to me. Here's my very high tech data delivery process. So this is really thinking about chain of custody of the data side, which is an enormous task. 
Uh, so I've simplified it to a red, red sticker, green sticker uh, uh, system, and, and I'm thinking about complicating it with some other colored stickers, but it's a Ziploc bag sticker process. So when you're finished with your zone, you come and take your SD card and you put it in the bag and you write your zone on it and you put a red sticker on it. That means I haven't backed up the data to our hard drive um, and crossed it off the kind of data list. And so I've simplified it for sheriffs and they love it. So that's just like, that's what they want to do is just hand off their SD cards uh, to me. And so uh, as high tech as drones are, red sticker, green sticker, Ziploc bag, done. I also had a dedicated data transfer person during uh, this particular event. It was a volunteer uh, technician. And what he would do then is back up all the data and check off each zone so that we had all of the photos for every single zone. That way, that, that way we could cross a, a zone, know that it was backed up and that it was ready to process and labeled in all our folders in a standard kind of nomenclature. So all that boring side of the mapping is like, how do you standardize the process in terms of tracking the data and make sure you don't waste people's time out in the field because you lost all the photos. From there, we use sneaker net, um, which means we drove hardware down, or hard drives of all the data down to San Francisco. Typically, I would process locally on my laptop. I would need 20 laptops running at once or a whole server system and or an incredibly fast internet connection of which I had neither. Uh, and so in this case, we're close proximity to San Francisco. We call the drone startup in San Francisco, drone deploy. They process a lot of drone imagery very quickly. And they just basically took that hard drive and just batch loaded it into their servers so that we could turn it around overnight. And, and we did this two days in a row and they stayed up all night just loading a thousand photos at a time to their system. Um, and then what I was able to do is log back into all my zones. And when they turn green, I know that map's done. So I can, in the field, track the whole process of the mapping and how they're processing in the cloud. And I can log in and look at those data and do quality assurance. We were also able to line up the different sections of the maps. And then we had someone from Drone Deploy planning gap missions. And gap missions were, here's a section of map, and they kind of line up, but there's a little area over here that you should go and get. And they would plan a little mission, and we would just send it off to a team. Uh, and they'd go get it in 10 minutes or so. And that way our maps are going to be fairly seamless in, as we put it all together. So we ordered, ultimately we had about four dozen zones or so and lots of gaps associated. And, and those were all individual sections of maps. So now what? Well, typically you would take all those map layers and you would upload those to say ArcGIS or something like that. It would tile them all so that you could zoom in and out online very easily. Um, but that was going to take about two weeks. And we had Thanksgiving in like two days. So basically what Drone Deploy did is they pulled another all-nighter. And they merged all of the four dozen or so map sections um, together into a single map. Uh, as well as we had all the blue dots are 360 panoramas that we took um, from some of the teams while they were waiting around, they would catch, uh, they would send the drone up and take a bunch of pictures uh, for, for panos, as well as the orange dots are georeferenced video of every single major road within the town. So we overlaid those all within, um, uh, within the streets and then we embedded that into the Butte County uh, website. And then I recorded this little, like, I had a GoPro and recorded a little technical video so that the Butte County Sheriff's Office didn't have to answer any questions, basically, on the technical side, that they could just answer. Um, so we made it very easy to just kind of embed it, answer all the questions, um, and then that was then released uh, to other agencies and then ultimately the public. So some statistics. In two days or so, we did about 500 flights. We did 70,000 photos or about a half a terabyte or so of information. This ultimately ended up being about 17,000 acres that we mapped. Um, we did about 175 panos video, and then we turned it around within 48 hours to all of the teams, and then we released it publicly on Thanksgiving Day. So it was just basically like impossible that we actually did all this stuff. And I like broke down crying when the map came out. My wife was like, what's wrong? And I'm like, you don't understand how hard this was. Um, but that's what we did. So it was a huge team effort, not just uh, the people here, but all the companies and stuff involved, like everybody basically within the drone ecosystem came together to kind of deliver this for Butte County. And so I felt up to this point, I feel like 
The drone industry is full of hype and smoke and mirrors and a lot of startup marketing, um, but like the whole ecosystem actually worked. Um, so ultimately what we came up with is a couple of different layers and I'll poke through these um, in the question time. Uh, this is a standard map layer. Um, this isn't, from drone deploy, we merged them into kind of other layers that are then owned by the county. Uh, but this is a before and after slider. So here's Google Maps, and then here's the imagery that you can zoom into about two inches. We have all the property boundaries uh, within the town, and then if you click on any house, then you get the actual address. And that's very useful uh, and a tool that they, they really like. We have all the panoramas, so when you click on a pano, it pops up and you can zoom around and pan, similar to kind of Google Street View. And then this geo-reference video, if you click on it, then it's a split screen between the video and a map, which I'll talk a little bit about. All those data essentially went to Butte County, but then they were actually used by other agencies involved. Initially, um, not just in the recovery effort, but the rains were coming, so they were thinking about erosion control, uh, uh, the EPA as well as kind of cow toxic substances was thinking about the cleanup side of things. FEMA uh, was interested in the data as well. FEMA doesn't use drones currently, um, but they're very interested in kind of drone data. Uh, and then of course, like I think the biggest impact is just the public. So we had about 30,000 people evacuated from the area, not allowed in to kind of see their community and their homes. It's very high resolution imagery that they can look at and just kind of understand the full scope of of what their lives are gonna be kind of moving forward. And so I think for me, that's a super impactful thing is just telling their story to the world and then allowing them to really kind of understand the full scope of, of what they're facing. Um, okay, so the rocky road moving forward is that like, this was all just kind of proof of concept. Like this is not a repeatable process that we have dialed in for agency use. and and. And there's really about five different problems still with using drones in kind of disasters. One, it's all about the disaster and the flight and the safety with, with these drone teams. They're building drone programs, but they are like, I have $50,000 to buy a drone or a whole lot of drones. And it's like, okay, well, what about the data side? And how are you gonna manage all the processing? And who's gonna do that? And where's the money for the technical specialist? And how are you gonna host it all? All those, th those other things, are like, those are boring things to fund versus like, let's buy some hardware and let's get out and fly. Um, there's no standard protocols and trainings for the data size. Who's certified to show up on scene to collect the data? Do they understand what apps to use? Are they all using the same apps? Like, there's no process there. Um, who owns the end of the funnel and the data? I hand all the data off to the coordinating agency. So that's Sonoma County for the Tubbs fire. That was Shasta County uh, and Redding uh, City for the car fire and it's Butte County for, um, uh, for the campfire. It's a different kind of end of the funnel each, each time. So who do, if the media wants a request for data or if citizens want a request for data, who do those go to? Uh, there's no kind of standard process in terms of who makes the call to make it public? How do you make that call? Those are all kind of very good questions about where's this funnel going? And that's all kind of out of my, uh, above my pay grade. Um, but I think that those are very valid questions in terms of information, not just from drone imagery, but also other, other types of data. Um, there's no resource requests currently for drone data. So these bureaucracies are all about what's a chart string and who do I bill to? Um, and when you don't, when you aren't typed, when you don't have a job that's described in that bureaucracy, uh, then you can't actually bill to it. So the, the sad truth for me is that like, I don't get paid for any of this stuff. And so I go in because number one, I know these guys and I like them and I wanna help my community. And number two, I didn't think California was gonna burn down three times in a row. But now that it's green and the fires are not burning, it's a very good time to have a conversation of like, look guys, if you want me to keep doing this stuff, like I need to get paid. I got bills to pay too. Um, and you should, I, have, I will send my wife as the negotiator. She, she knows what my value is. Um, <laughs> probably better than I do. Uh, the other problem is that the tech industry is a cheetah, it's moving fast. New drones come out every three months or so, and then there's new software and new analytics and new tools, and incorporating those into these kind of agencies that move incredibly slow is like, how do you do that? How do you keep up with that? Um, so basically there's two things um, that I wanna kind of end with. Is one, this is how I think that they should run it all. Um, as a plant biologist that lives in El Cerrito, um, I'm sure they'll listen to me. Um, but this is like how it should work. 
Basically, you split the data side from the operations and safety side. So you have CAL FIRE that's running kind of their air attack and you have the FAA which controls the airspace. They basically, there's a drone Airbus and there's a manned aircraft Airbus, just run the flight and safety through that standard procedure that with air attack and coordination that's happening now. And the drone teams kind of just fall under that wing of CAL FIRE and everybody will be comfortable because we're all talking to each other. And recently we, in the campfire, we had an observer uh, from CAL FIRE there and with a radio and anytime any aircraft were coming in the area, we just call in and everybody feels comfortable knowing who's flying, they know we're there, uh, we know they're there, et cetera. Then you separate that from the intelligence side. So basically on the intelligence side, this is the flow of information that happens uh, within an emergency. And so that is basically all of the stakeholders at the top that are part of that kind of disaster coordination. So that's CAL FIRE, CAL OES, the county, the municipalities, that's FEMA. Um, the drones just basically fit um, under that wing of data capture. And really I feel like the drones are just one slice of information. There's also manned aircraft, there's satellite data, there's body camera data, there's fixed camera data. That's just the imagery side. What about all the weather data and other information coming in? That really needs to be a central hub or central repository that all the information is being fed into, condensed down into something that could actually, you could make a decision on, um, and then fed up to the very agencies. And drones, basically you have a drone data coordinator that works with the drone flight coordinator, and they work together to coordinate the drone teams, but all that information should go to a centralized place. That's in an ideal world. So that's how I would structure it. Um, and just kind of fit it into the existing infrastructure with safety and ops, talking to the data side, feeding into a central data, and then higher up. The other thing that I did, um, and this is mostly um, for my own conscience uh, as a PhD and someone that likes to teach, is I built a whole online class that just launched yesterday um, where I teach people and teams um, basically to do everything that I do. And it's about 10 hours of training. Um, or so, and then I'll, I sell that now for $397. Um, and so if you wanna take that, it's, a, it's called Rapid Response Drone Data. Um, and it's basically for teams that are building drone programs and, don't, and, and it will be a course that's there when they realize that uh, it's all about the data and the data side and how to do that. Um, and so this is basically to say like, when you call me during a disaster, you have 10 hours to learn everything that there is to do it yourself. Um, or you better figure out a way to pay me because it's super stressful to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I built an online course basically to scale the training side of it. And that's kind of my, my um, you know, keeping my conscience clear of like, look, I, I, I learned so much from these events. Let me share it with other people. Um, so I'll just end on kind of one um, big key take home point if you didn't pay attention to all the rest of the talk. And that, that is that these emergencies and these disasters, they really require a well-coordinated data funnel. So from the, basically from the data, the drone pilots to the analysts to the coordinated agencies. So you, they really need to know and establish a precedent for how to capture, process, visualize, and then inform that. And until we do that, we won't be able to scale kind of drones as a, as a technology and a solution. And then really everything just ends up in a hard drive uh, in somebody's drawer somewhere. And we've seen this all for hurricanes and we've seen this for other events and earthquakes when drone teams have come in and no one's there to process the information very quickly. Um, then it just kind of, you sit with a hard drive with 800 videos or so. Um, so that's kind of, I threw a lot out there. Um, you can always get a hold of me at Greg at Scholar Farms. Um, I'm local here in El Cerrito. I much would prefer to map your vineyard um, than a disaster zone. Um, but I'll take some questions and, and we can look a little bit at, at some of the data layers. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. So you mentioned sort of the data ecosystem that surrounds this uh, just, just kind of briefly. Uh, could, could you characterize that? Uh, maybe going backwards in time to the pri prior information you have. Uh, take as an example the the Berkeley Hills, you know, or yeah, Oakland, so Oakland Hills. What would you, what would you, from your point of view as a participant in a larger system, what should be known ahead of time, mm -hmm. both in general in terms of vegetation as well as what kind of operational plan is appropriate for this area? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, 
So one of the things that, that is, is really useful is to have a baseline of information in terms of, of, of what, does this, what did this look like prior to a disaster coming in. So here's the, the data layer on, in Butte County. We have the satellite data, um, and this is all in ArcGIS, right? Most of the municipalities and agencies use ArcGIS. It's the Microsoft Office of Mapping Software. Um, so this is satellite data, but this could very easily be high resolution aerial data from manned aircraft or s at smaller spatial scales, drones. Uh, probably manned aircraft for the Berkeley Hills um, is going to uh, see a much quicker approval than flying drones over the Berkeley Hills. Uh, and in this case, then you can uh, do very quick uh, comparisons there in kind of the before and after. So here's your, your slider um, and we can zoom in as well. Uh, this is kind of the one standard data layer of just kind of 2D information, but it actually takes a lot of data processing to get to that point. One thing that I really like um, is the 360 panoramas. And the reason that I like those is that they can be at kind of designated uh, crucial points, um, but when we click on them and zoom out, it's much more, this is 23 photos or so, um, and I can zoom way in. It's better when the, when the lights are, are off, but then everyone will fall asleep. Uh, and I can tag different information layers in there. And the nice thing about this is that uh, they're very quick to collect and uh, they're very easy for people to interact with. However, they are slightly more creative to think about, so they're not kind of the standard data layer that are, that's in ArcGIS currently. Uh, but I think having this kind of information um, at crucial kind of point locations uh, within, within, the, within the infrastructure of the data side of things. So 2D, 360, and then the video side. So I'll show you the video real quick. Did you have a... Yeah, you can. It's, um, there's currently needs to be some work in terms of the pointing direction. You have to set the pointing direction within the pano. But yeah, you could have, the panoramas are just a stretched out photo um, that they put in a viewer. So it's not hard that you could integrate information. If you knew what the focal distance of the camera is and where you flew, you could put in information. But you could also just tag it manually. So you could say, okay, here's the center point of where I flew. Here's this property, that property, that property, and annotate accordingly. Um, let's see if this guy will pop up. Let me refresh my Air Bears visitor. Um, the video side to me is the most interesting thing. And the reason for that is that this was an experiment that I ran um, with three teams of sheriffs uh, in the very final side of mapping um, uh, the campfire. So we had about 90 minutes left. We had finished most of the maps and I had some sheriffs that were um, uh, standing around and so I assigned them an experiment um, and I kind of treat these guys as like uh, they're like well-armed undergrads and so for me as like a former professor it's like all right ready go so what we did is we assigned them each major street uh, within paradise as well as kind of the major cross streets and what they would do is there was a driver and a, a pilot at the same time and they would drive the pilots to the next kind of section and they would capture video and so when I open up this video you can see here on the right, this is an ArcGIS data layer that can be any kind of data layer. But when I press play then, you can see this little dot that's in here. This is the drone flying down at the bottom. So I know where I'm at. I can overlay the property boundaries in here and I can get a fairly large perspective then uh, of the landscape. So what's interesting about this is if I fast forward, um, uh, you can get kind of a thumbnail, I can skip around, et cetera. What I think, what is really fascinating about this is Video is the, and manually flying a drone is the easiest possible thing I can get a sheriff to do that knows that's part of a drone program. They already know how to do this. They don't have to learn anything new and it gets them out flying very quickly and you can get a very good kind of perspective. The more interesting thing is we finished every major street video mapping in 60 minutes. So if you uh, want to map something incredibly quickly and it was six gigabytes of data. And so if you wanna map something incredibly quickly for example, San Francisco after an earthquake. Basically, I can map the entire town with X number of drone teams in you know, the first few hours of a disaster. And I can do this in color and I can do it in thermal at night. And basically, I can get you all of the main critical infrastructure incredibly quickly. Now, it's not a map, but you can then go through manually or you can extract information from the video. So I feel like just do this in the first couple of hours and then decide what you really want map layers. 
uh, for. And so, so it's basically kind of building it out. Do this, think about point locations and panoramas, and then overlay your map areas. And do it before a disaster hits, and do it after. The freestanding structures that burn down that are, are not near trees or erupt a lot of type of discussion that it's really hard to make sense of any of it. Yeah, it was, it was this was the first time um, that, especially for the panoramas, we released panoramas and stuff before, um, that someone emailed and was like, dude, you're in InfoWars. And it was some online discussion groups about how this was all just kind of uh, a, a giant conspiracy to like burn down certain sections of neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt like, I didn't even Google, um, I feel like, I don't even want to start on that kind of side of things, but I feel like, look, this is the best data set that you could have for understanding fire dynamics within the state and how they burn in. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. And if you could use it, do you think there's a stage, at all? this gentleman's question here, I was, got my thoughts flowing. Is there a place where you can get to where you can be in there proactively or simultaneous to the fires and get the drones out there so that they can map those dynamics that you're talking about, the fire dynamics? Yeah, during having drones within active wildfires currently is, um, is, is super sen sensitive at the low altitude. So currently they map the fire perimeters using Reapers, um, the big military drones out of um, and that's Air National Guard out of San Diego. And that's at night when manned aircraft doesn't fly there. The, the drones are up there mapping that, the fire perimeters. Um, the interesting thing I thought about the info wars was like, oh, maybe like Russian hackers like totally got a hold of like the drone data and are gonna use it for like some sort of uh, uh, kind of info, you know, propaganda. And I, and I also felt like that was a really weird state of the world that we're in where that could actually be a possibility so it was one of those things but yeah i feel like i don't you know in terms of the negative side of drones which most people are familiar with i think this is probably the best case in history of how drones could actually be useful and why and and i th i know drones are annoying they're annoying and they buzz and and it's like there's dudes down at the beach flying them and they shouldn't be because we're just trying to like have a picnic or whatever and my kids there and all that I get all of that side and and that's not what this is it's not what it is yeah uh, you talked about optimizing the data pipeline but you can't really transfer six gigabytes of information continuously from the recording all the way to the agency so in terms of that optimization what kind of data would be crucial and mm -hmm. on those lines uh, what uh, what is the kind of visibility that multiple stakeholders would need yeah, so um, you don't need two inch resolution for most applications. Actually, when if we think about the video, um, and there are some machine learning applications that are happening, if you could just extract the information for the properties that are damaged versus undamaged, that information is just a couple of megabytes, right? It's just location-based points in there. And so if we could optimize, uh, video is the easiest thing because it's so cheap and easy to collect and can be live, it's live streaming back to a tablet or a computer. Um, there's a, uh, a company called Unleash Live that's thinking about that. This can be extracted and then put into like a KML file format or some very cheap file format so that the entire town and all of the damage assessment would be 10 megabytes of data, like equivalent to two photos versus like all of the imagery. We don't need the imagery and in fact, this information isn't useful because it doesn't fit into the standards operating systems that uh, CAL FIRE is using. But you know what CAL FIRE uses on all of these fires? pins and lines on maps. It's basically cartography. And so just extract the information as pins, location-based information and perimeters so that they can put it into their system and just do that. Just do it. It's super cheap and this is a thousand dollar drone. So that's kind of trying to think simpler of like, sure, drones are like really capable of all this kind of stuff, but like, do we really need to do that if we're just doing pins and lines on maps? Like, let's start with like, incremental change before we try and get revolutionary change. But that would be common sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and you outlined um, some really compelling recommendations for what all contextualizes as disaster response, working with public agencies. 
What are some of the notable differences for um, a similar effort, but not in a disaster context and with public agencies? Like, where do you see this potentially expanding into? Sure. Um, so I, I still talk to academics. I try not to because I won't make. I don't make many money with them either. Um, and like, basically, I'm never going to make money as a business person. I should go back to academia. Um, basically, it's in long-term monitoring. So currently, we work with a, a grant out of um, the UC NRS, the Nature Reserve System. Um, it's a Moore Foundation grant for understanding watershed and vegetation dynamics. And basically, drones are good at long-term, very high-resolution time series information. And so whether that's at nature reserves across California, I was just talking to a group in Kenya that wants to integrate satellite data and drone data and then wildlife abundance, um, as well as kind of tracking information and kind of merging those layers. You can think of them as like, basically you're just crowdsourcing 300 foot cell phone pictures, you know, and that there's a lot of capabilities that are there for thinking about broad scale geographic patterns, whether that's natural ecosystems and monitoring them over time, whether it's vegetation management and defensible space. Um, it, it's basically we've democratized aerial imagery. You don't need to pay five grand for an airplane flight over once a year. Uh, you can crowdsource that sort of information. And so that's useful for all sorts of different applications and another reason drones aren't quite as annoying as they might seem. I'm actually going to that meeting like after this for, for uh, the UC reserve system. So that's merging satellite data, drone data, weather station data, uh, manual counts on the ground. How do we merge all of that information together and how do we do that through time and then how do you analyze all that? Those are all very interesting research questions. Okay. Um, I think we should wrap this up. I want to thank Greg for being here. Yeah, that was incredibly you. informative. So.